most notorious drug lord, Pablo Escobar, is apparently on the run after staging an uprising at his jail. Colombian soldiers stormed the prison just before dawn today after Escobar and his lieutenants took hostages. Escobar apparently managed to escape through a tunnel after a gun battle that left at least two people dead. The world's number one cocaine trafficker remains a fugitive from prison. It's a prison that he practically ran before he ran away. Juan Vasquez has more about the search for answers and for Pablo Escobar. The Colombian government continued an all-out manhunt for Escobar today, but critics called it closing the barn door after the horse had fled. Many critics always thought it absurd that the world's number one drug trafficker was allowed to build and control his own prison. The only thing that was holding him there was his own security force, and he was free to leave as he chose, and he chose to leave now. Escobar escaped as the government tried to move him to a higher security prison. While on the run, he called a Bogota radio station and vowed to fight to the death, a threat that set the entire country on edge because the last time he waged war, hundreds died. El procurador... Colombia's president appealed for Escobar to surrender. The escape is a blow to the government of Colombia, which just last year boasted in U.S. newspaper ads that it had virtually won the drug war. But the drug war was never won on the streets of America. Here, cocaine remains easily available, and officials say the jailing of Escobar and other Colombian drug lords has made no significant difference. Just three weeks ago, bales of Colombian cocaine rained down on South Florida during an airplane chase between U.S. Customs and drug traffickers. Some residents awoke to find cocaine in their front yard. Well, anytime Pablo Escobar is uh, uh, on the lam and uh, once again uh, operating in the cocaine trade, it would uh, uh, certainly hurt the world, not just the United States. If Escobar is not caught soon, authorities fear he will never be caught and will continue his billion-dollar business shipping cocaine into the world's number one cocaine market, the United States. Juan Vasquez, CBS News, Miami. An unconfirmed report tonight from Colombia says Escobar is now offering to surrender if the government guarantees his safety. Ready? Three, two, one. This was Pablo Escobar's room, his prison cell. It had lots of comfortable couches, a fireplace, a large kitchen area, paintings, plants, and his wanted poster tacked to the wall. It Does it? Okay. Ready? This was Pablo Escobar's room, his prison cell. It had lots of comfortable couches, a fireplace, paintings, plants, a huge kitchen area, and his wanted poster tacked to the wall.
porque son los que tenían la dirección de la prisión. Nosotros solamente por evidencias podemos saber. Esto sí. Viene la favorita con el grupo Caneo, los muchachos y Jorge Gales. Pero si uso mi hand, me voy a poner...
Seguimos. Lo más, ahorita ya lo más interesante es la las partes de arriba. La parte de arriba aquí.
Three, two, one. Authorities say they have also found photographs of wild parties here, where guards dressed in tuxedos serve dinner and drinks to the inmates. Ready? Three, two, three, two, one. Authorities say they have fo three, two, one. Authorities say they have also found photographs of wild parties here, where guards dressed in tuxedos serve dinner and drinks to the inmates. Three, two, one. Authorities say they have also found photographs of wild parties here, where guards dressed in tuxedos serve dinner and drinks to the inmates. Three, two, one. Authorities say they have also found photographs of wild parties. Three, two, one. Authorities say they have also found photographs of wild parties here, where guards dressed in tuxedos served dinner and drinks to the inmates. Okay. Again, with the fascinating and frightening story of one of the world's most powerful and rich drug lords, Andrew and Leslie Coburn traveled to Colombia to chronicle for Vanity Fair magazine the story of Pablo Escobar, the most wanted man in the Western Hemisphere. They join us now with their story. Welcome. Good to Thank see you, you here. You. Uh, t tell me who he is. Uh, this is somebody I've talked about on this broadcast before, but set the stage and take him uh, from his rise to power and wealth to his decision to uh, allow himself to be put in a prison of his own making. Okay, well, Pablo Escobar 
st uh, comes from Medellin. Right. Uh, started life. Medellin being a region of Colombia. Yeah, the uh, second biggest city in Colombia. He, he was poor, parents were poor, his father was a peasant. He started off as a low level criminal, but he had discovered a gift that he had for a really incredible gift for organization. And he really pioneered the industrial s scale supply of cocaine to this country. I to mean, the United States. To the United States. I mean, not just you know, a little kilo here, a kilo there, but plane loads, ship loads. What did he know that other people didn't know or understand or put into effect? He didn't really invent anything, but he had the gift for organization and instilling fear. Mm -hmm. I mean, he could impose discipline. I mean, in a 5,000 kilo load, Pablo going through the accounts later would discover one kilo missing. He was on the phone. He wanted to know why, and if he didn't get a good explanation, someone was dead. Okay. So, the, the, but his the, role was as a distributor. He was a person who transported the cocaine. He didn't make cocaine. He didn't, cre you know, he, he was a man who distributed. Well, that's the point, yeah. That these big, you know, the big cartels, right. I mean, what they do is it's not so much the, um, you know, making it or, you know, flogging it on the right. streets here. It's getting it here, Federal right. Express, if you like. Right. And so go ahead. So he creates an enormous business that makes him a billionaire several times over. Yeah, three billion dollars by yeah. some category, or yeah. more. But and he used force, fear, killing, eliminating rivals, and anybody who did not deliver, he killed them. Yeah, but not just ruthless. I mean, ruthless, yes, but also he had an incredible talent for manipulating the Colombian political scene. I mean. yeah, this is Don Pablo. This is a man who... Um you know, would hire the kids of Medellin to come and work for him. And he eventually ended up with an army of about 3,000 people just in Medellin and Envigado. And according to his friends, who describe it very well, he ran a court, a kind of court, he, he, in his uh, very fancy place in Poblado, which is a ritzy right. district of Medellin. Uh, his office was sort of up on a platform and the supplicants would come in to ask Pablo for favors. So he had it, there's a certain theatrical quality there. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was, um, he's very aware of the comparison with himself to a mafia don. All right, I want to, uh, the two stories I want to tell here. One, his story and your effort to find his story. First, the, uh, his story continuing. He also became a, what, a senator? He, uh, he was a congressman. Congressman. Yeah. And he had this sort of... He, of a liberal bent. Yes, oh yes, he's a liberal, you know, and he built, uh, he saw himself as sort of Robin Hood. He, I think he genuinely felt this way. He, you know, he was going to do good for the people. He was going to be president one day, and he yeah. wouldn't forget the poor people like other a people. A dream he still has. A dream he still has, even yeah. today. Yeah. So he goes on and he makes a zillions of dollars, and then all of a sudden they kill a leading presidential candidate, much in the JFK mold. Someone does. I mean, he's been blamed for it, yeah. but it's not clear he did it. But the result... Might have been Rodriguez gotcha. Yeah, another right. even much more fearsome and terrifying drug lord. Now dead. Rich. Now dead, thank God. The evidence points to him. The yeah. man who was protecting Galan in that campaign told us... Galan being the presidential candidate. Exactly. And the man who was um, uh, his protector said um, it was Rodriguez gotcha and yeah. others who were outside the so-called yeah. narcosphere. And in fact, there are examples of, and I don't, this is a ruthless, mean killer who was imported to the United States, a lot of cocaine, which has done enormous destruction. But at the same time, there are instances in which he goes against the sort of mode of some of the other drug lords in that he saves the lives of some novelists because he loves to read and all this other stuff. That's right. He was doing, you know, he was the... A fellow named Child, right? Yeah, Gatcha wanted to kill this guy because he was a leftist, and... Uh, uh, fortunately, a friend of Child's went to Escobar and said, Gacha wants to kill Child. And, Ch and Escobar says, hey, I admire yeah. Child. I like his writing. I'll, I'll call Gacha right yeah. now and tell him not to do it. Finally, he decides that he, it's in his interest to give up. Yeah, he'd been at war with the state. I mean, the, the biggest issue was extradition. The Americans were saying, send them all up here and we'll put them in chains for the rest of their life. Um, That's the great fear as... To, right. Just to be extradited to the United States and better, face trial and be put into American prison where you have no control and no power. Right. They say better a coffin in Colombia than a jail in the United right. States. So they, um, so there's a, a war basically between Pablo uh, and allies and the state. I mean, it, it went on for over a year mm -hmm. with bombs going off and everything. Finally, the Colombian state negotiates a deal uh, with Pablo. I mean, they don't win. They say, all right, they come to an agreement, and the agreement was that Pablo would go to a house basically, a very nice house, high up over Medellin, beautiful view, that he owned himself, so had redecorated. Created in his own sale. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
And he d makes this deal because what? Why does he make the deal? Well, he wants to, he figures that if he goes into this, you know, into a jail, I mean, the, the, in exchange, I should say, the, uh, the Colombians said, okay, we drop extradition. No more, you don't have to worry about that anymore. We drop that. Uh, well, you know, they, they'd agreed, they had all sorts of things built in so, so Pablo wouldn't spend very long in jail, like maybe eight, nine years. That was it. So and it was a good he, deal he, for him. Then he gets out and he's got all his money. But he wanted protection. This is a man who had very serious enemies, still has very serious enemies, in a rival cartel, a cartel that's actually bigger. Their operation is bigger now in Cali, which the is Cali a cartel. rival city state. And the Cali people have been trying to kill him. You know, they bombed Why do they buildings. Want to kill him? Because he's a rival, um, you know, this goes back, this is ancient history in the drug business. And here's one of the interesting things in your piece in Vanity Fair. It is that the Kali gang goes to the Salvadorian Army Air Force. and the Air Force, and they buy some bombs. Yeah. Buy them. Yeah. And they also, and what they're going to do is send the plane, supposedly, into drop these bombs on this prison, decimate everybody, and their enemy, their rival, is gone. Right. But he was beat, that's, that's what they wanted to do, but this being crazy Colombia, Pablo was being guarded by the Colombian equivalent of the head of the Secret Service. Right. I mean, he was in charge of the prison. So this guy, I mean, he told us about it. He said, well, we got the intelligence. They, the Cali cartel had got the bombs, so he digs an air raid shelter and right. also authorizes the guards to open fire on anyone flying overhead. And at one point, there was a Colombian Air Force plane flying over the plane in a way they thought was suspicious. So the Guards who are from the Colombian Army open fire on the Colombian Air Force, which is flying over, over the jail. Okay, finally, to bring this story to the sort of dramatic point, it is that uh, there's a decision by the Colombian government to do what? To go get him. In July? Yes. Well, there was a decision that's actually the circumstances of which are very, still very murky and confused. Um, they decided that they wanted to move him to another prison. But there were several Colombian government agencies who were there that night in July, and all of them had a different mission. Yeah. One gang was going to take him to Bogota, another gang was going to keep him in Medellin at an army barracks. And so, in fact, Escobar got very frightened. He thought, this isn't what they want to do, they want to kill me. So he yeah. got on the phone to the lawyers, and the lawyers were calling the president, and they couldn't get through to Gaviria, to the yeah. president of Colombia. So it was very Who dramatic. Who was basically sending a message, I'm in a meeting, I can't talk he now. He said, I'm in a meeting. Right. You know, call me later. So they called and called and called. Finally, Escobar did not leave that jail, or so-called jail, until 7 o'clock in the morning, when the army was coming in, I mean, special forces guys were coming, coming in, in to get him. blazing away and yeah. with grenades. Did they want to kill him or did they want to take him prisoner? It's not clear whether they want to, um, no one really knows. I mean, there's three possibilities. One is that they're telling the truth, right. that they wanted just to move him to another jail while they improved security at this jail. The second is they wanted to kill him. The third is that there was a scheme with the U.S., to pull him out of there and send him back in okay. chains to the US in time for the Republican convention. Speak to that issue because what he believed, Pablo Escobar believed that, that the Bush administration wanted to come get him because they thought that his capture would mean a kind of electoral push surge for the Bush administration. So he was fearful of the United States playing a role in taking him out of Colombia. Right. Absolutely. Pablo it's is in his mind. Pablo is a man of not small ego. Right. Uh, I mean, partly justified, but he really thought that his capture would re-elect Bush. So that when, and he's been, he was sitting there in jail all the way through the summer as Bush went down the polls. Yeah. The sec I mean, Bush was depressed by that, but the second most depressed person by it was Pablo, Pablo thinking, oh my God, his disapproval ratings up to 45%. It'll make him do something dramatic. Yeah, he'll to come try get to, me. Okay. He's there, he looks at the dangers to him, the Kali gang wants to get him, the Colombian government wants to get him, he thinks that the Americans want to get him. Do you know whether the United States had a presence in Medellin and were involved in some effort to go after him? D DEA or whoever might be. Well, there's very, there's an enormous American presence in Colombia and in Medellin. In terms of DEA people or what kind there of people? There are DEA people, there are special forces people, there are, there's a whole contingent there from Southern Command in Panama uh -huh. who are, their intelligence planes, U-2s, you know. Uh, I mean, we were getting complaints from senior generals in the Colombian Ministry of Defense saying the Americans are crawling all over this building. Yeah. It's very political. And so, why would the Americans be there? Well, they want to... <laughs> oh, you take Double this one, darling. Oh, double action. Yeah. 
They, um, Bush is desperate, well, was desperate, um, for a victory in the war on drugs, first yeah. of all. And the Bush policy on drugs was not so much treatment in this country, but was go to the source, right. cut off the supply, uh, and so forth, which has well, been a bit of a bust as a, as a policy. So getting Escobar, I mean, Pablo was right, in a way. I mean, it wouldn't have re-elected Bush, yeah. but it would have at last been a victory in the war on drugs. So a lot of people's careers, you know, you know yeah. if you get Pablo... Okay, so you had some American presence there, clearly, oh, yeah. in Medellin. Pablo escapes. Where is he today? In Medellin. In Medellin. And, and why isn't he captured? Why can't they get him, and, and either the Kali gang, the government, or somebody? What does he have going for him? Other than, and I'll make this one quick point, he was receiving in, as a kind of payment in return for giving himself up and taking some of the heat off of the Medellin cartel. He was receiving from other drug runners, drug pushers, drug cartel members, a hundred million dollars a month. That's right. That yeah. figure comes from the Colombian chief prosecutor. Yeah. And, the same prosecutor and the same prosecutor says to you guys, I guess, says, whatever I thought the amount of money generated by the drug trade, it had no relationship to how extraordinary the amount of money that was produced by the drug trade. But then, you, then you, look at, you look at that $100, $100 million a month. A month, yeah. And you say, what, what could he possibly spend it on? And the answer is, he has an incredible intelligence network. Mm -hmm. I mean, the so joke, he's paying off people all the time. The joke in Colombia now is that his intelligence is really degraded because he's in hiding. It's, his, it's on a par with the Colombian government. Where is he and why isn't he captured as we speak on November, um, whatever it is? He's in 11th. his hometown of Envigado, well, a suburb of Can they get him if they want to? I mean, he has this great thing that, it, that the easiest way to escape detection is, 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 in a sense, to blend in and to do what? What was that great well, he, he said, a friend of his, uh, who was a friend of ours, we were talking to, he said he'd saw, seen him recently, and he said, how come you're so good at hiding? And Pablo said, ah, the best way to hide is not to hide. Why does Pablo think he's going to emerge from all of this, with all these forces after him? He still has this sort of eternal hope that somehow he's going to come out of this with all his money and with power and still be able to somehow, I mean, maybe this is the illusion, so... Uh, the delusions of grandeur or whatever it is. What is it about him that makes him think somehow that he still has power and potential? Well, he knows. I mean, this is a very Colombian attitude he has. He knows, first of all, he knows who he's paying. Right. You have to remember, he's not only paying telephone operators, right. he's paying off military people. I mean, we talked to a lot of people in the 4th Brigade in Medellin who, uh, who said, you know, I mean, one of them said, look, I, I can't even write on a typewriter or a computer because I know anything I write down will go straight to Pablo. So well, he's I got hand notes. Yes. Right. Intelligence agencies, etc. Yeah. And he thinks that he can go in and stay for a very short period of time, six or seven years, and emerge and he will have paid enough people, enough politicians and whatever, to be in that good position. He'll have access to his money and can do whatever he wants to do. Uh, well, tell me what you think is going to happen to him. Andrew. Well, it's one of two possibilities. He wants to surrender again right yeah. now. But, he, um, but, but a lot of people want him dead, including not only his enemies within Medellin, but also the Kali gang, and including the Colombian government, think he's probably better off dead than alive. The Colombian, yeah, and particularly the Colombian police. I mean, yeah. at the moment, it's open season on Colombian policemen. A lot of policemen in, in, sorry, in Medellin, have been, it's been 30 in the last two weeks, have been killed ever since a friend of Pablo's got killed two weeks ago. Yeah. So he wants to, what he wants to do is make it back to jail without being killed on the way, once he emerges from his hiding place, to get to the jail. He's got to make that alive. Secondly, he's got to have guarantees that he, you know, can believe in that the next step isn't onto the plane and back to Miami. Okay, one last question. How close did you get to seeing him, dealing with him face to face? Um, we got as... We got a very, well, uh, the best way to it is... It's a letter from him. It's a letter from him. Signed by him? Signed by him. Okay. Handwritten. Okay. C can you come in on this, guys? Let me just see this. This is, says to Andrew Coburn... Uh, well, I can't read a, a Spanish. What is this It writing? says, um, thank you very much. I'd, I'd, I'd love to meet with you. Unfortunately, my present conditions of uh, secrecy make it rather difficult, and I hope we can get together. And who delivered this to you? Well, it didn't come by ordinary Colombian male. Well, uh, so you had access to somebody who was in contact with I him, had, yeah, we were, we were one person away. You see his yeah, thumbprint yeah. there yeah. on the second page. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, it's one a very... One person away. Yeah. So it's a very courteous letter, and he says, oh, I'm really sorry I can't meet with you, yeah. and he, he gives some quite interesting Colombian political I, If you and I came back a year from now, you think you'll be alive? The odds are against it, I mean, thinking rationally, but yeah, he will be alive, I think. Yeah. Leslie? I agree.
Okay. Thank you very much. Vanity Fair, the story by Andrew Coburn and Leslie Coburn called On the Trail of Medellin's Cocaine.